let's see if we can find some interesting common ground here from uh, people, questions. Can I make already? a comment first uh, just yeah, to sure. connect up the talks? So, Phil, I didn't know what Phil was going to talk about, but it turns out that your story fits in beautifully with the whole neuroeconomic story because of the discount factor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it, so it, it, back up a bit. Uh, dopamine is not the only neuromodulator in the brain. There's another one called serotonin. And serotonin, it turns out, the level of activity of serotonin is a very strong predictor of behavior, and especially if it's low risk-taking behavior. And if it's high, you tend to be high in the social scale. In monkeys, the highest levels are in the alpha male. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, there's a very good model now that we have called temporal difference learning, which accounts for uh, the dopamine signal, but there's an extra parameter in it. So uh, re recall that I said that dopamine predicts whether the stimulus will give you a future reward, but I didn't say how far into the future, right? And, and now the, the question is, do you account for uh, the next moment uh, as, as being more important than the next day or the next year? And that discount factor is now there's evidence that that may well be the serotonin level. Well, the, the extent, the extent. Yeah, the extent to which you're willing. In other words, if, you're, if, if the discount factor is one, then it means that um, whether I get it today or tomorrow is no different. And, and so therefore, I'll wait the future. I can integrate over the entire future. But if the discount factor is zero, then tomorrow's reward is worth nothing to me. I will take whatever I have now. And you can manipulate that in experiments. And you can show, that, for example, if you give them a task that requires going through several negative, uh, uh, either the, you have a choice. You can either uh, go down one path, which is a lot of small positives, or if you're willing to take a couple hits first, negatives, there's a much bigger positive reward. And depending on what your serotonin level is, you'll either go one way or the other. Well. There's a book by uh, Ainsley, George Ainsley, who's done a lot of work on this hyperbolic discounting. Can anybody elaborate on that a little bit for me? I mean, is it called Breakdown of the Will? Yes. Yes, yeah. It, I mean, you've described it well. Oh, okay. well. And also, I saw a nice paper in Science about six months ago in which in humans they manipulated serotonin levels, and they showed this modulated uh, people's likelihood of taking unfair offers in the ultimatum game, this game I use to measure generosity. Um, so people who had lower serotonin levels were much more present-oriented. So I'll just, whatever you're giving me, I'll take it. I don't want to reject this for some longer-term benefit of sending a signal of punishment. So I think there's very good convergent evidence there. And that's in science? That's in science. science. Yeah. yeah, Terry, could I just ask you one little technical question? Okay, okay. Uh, why would, uh, you, you sort of said as you went through this, nobody had thought of varying the reward for year. Why not? I mean, what on earth would people keep on well, doing the it, same experiment? I think experiment? it's because we all get uh, into a rut, into our uh, routine, and everybody does it this way. All the previous experiments have been done this way, and therefore you don't even think of changing it. And it re required a real mind shift, one of these you know, insights that, uh, gee, you know, what if we uh, give it a different reward, not just uh, – it turns out that uh, monkeys also – have preferences. For example, some like grape juice better than orange juice. And so that will also be reflected in the neurons. Mm -hmm. The neurons in the parietal cortex reflect how much reward you're getting in terms of the number of drops, the quality of the reward, some juices are better than others, and the probability of reward. It's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Right, it's just that, I mean, I'm just wondering what the, what the monkey was uh, just reporting for duty every day, and there was no change in the reward. What's it doing? It just, it, it just seemed to make no sense. But so, Roger, we've been George um, Koob is at the back there, waiting for a microphone. Well, there's another reason why reward wasn't varied, and that's because of the heavy behavioristic that's influence right. on American psychology, right. such that reward was not a word that was even used. It was reinforcement, and reinforcement yeah. was the probability, you know, increase in the probability of response and it was all contingencies of reinforcement so part of the part of the uh, what do you call it focal vision the narrowing of vision had to do with that historical fact as well and ethology wasn't really studied that much in the United States it came from Europe so the parallel what? development in economics is the, that of revealed preferences so using previous choice to predict yeah. Choice. Thanks. I actually did not. I just wanted to, say, <laughs> to so draw that out to show that how different shifts in science do happen. So we would call this rational rationality. So again, the, the organizing principle always is evolution, and the brain itself is an economic organ. It has goals, it has limited resources to affect those goals, and as Terry said, it will only affect those goals in a way that allows the species to reach its ultimate goals of survival and reproduction. It's not going to run at 1,000% capacity or 100% capacity at all times because why waste the resources? So, so let's go through the panel one by one. By, by. What did you think when you, when you saw uh, what happened?
what happened over the last two weeks, this the sort of meltdown. And do, did you actually have any practical application of what you were think, uh, to, to seeing what people were doing? Did you say, oh, I know why they're doing that? Or did you say, oh, my God, why are they doing that? Or how do we explain that? What? Uh, it seems like a lot hurting to me. It seems like there's a, there's a great overreaction because of the uncertainty in the world. We are uncertainty averse. We don't like uncertainty. And I think this is kind of my personal view, only informed by the information you guys have, not any special information, is that we're uncertainty averse and I'd rather write a big check and get rid of the uncertainty. The markets certainly want that. Um, as you see, the market's moving around, whether the bailout's approved or not approved. Uh, so I think this actually can be dangerous. This is where I think the brain science is important. If you know that your brain is set up to take the certain payoff, uh, even if it's uh, more expensive, then you should be able to suppress that. So I think there's a great overreaction. Well, yeah. I guess what, what I'm trying to get at is, is, is uh, if with the work that's now being done in neuroeconomics, people coming into your labs, people lying in scanners, uh. Uh, various fMRI experiments and so on, how does this advance be as beyond the movie Wall Street and Greed is Good? I mean, uh, w what do we now know that's of, of, of subtly different and in useful information? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not answering the neuros. You, you want to go. Um, several things are really important. Given a complex issue, one of the things that we have ignored is that from the 1990s, our government has pushed to make every American a homeowner. And every American can't afford to be a homeowner because it's expensive to own a home. And that's really been a push from top down. There's, uh, I think, 1990, maybe 60 percent of Americans own a home. And the goal, s goal of many presidential administrations was to up that to 70. So there was a, a general push on the market to give loans. Uh, and as I said, you know, it was rational before you, you, you gave some loans, you didn't give loans where, you know, where there was such uh, high risk. And then it got to be where it, it was, as I said, in the Commons Dilemma, where they fished every sardine out of the sea in Monterey, where everybody is, everybody is in for the kill. And you know at some rational level that if we all take all the sardines out that we can each day, at some point the resource will be depleted. And there was warnings all along saying, you know, there are not enough reserves to cover your loans. And you know, all of these places, people say, yes, but he's doing it. Yes, but he's doing it. And why should I drop out and, and go for the low yield? Uh, and so it was a funny kind of, kind of mass conformity going toward uh, the irrational, going toward what I'm saying is this present-oriented, very short-term decision. It'll get better in the future, that somehow it'll work.